Mother's Day. Uh, I hope that that put a smile on your face and uh, just want to say thank God for the women he's put in our lives that we call mom. Uh, what a difference they make. Amen. And uh, it, you're, you're worthy of honor and to be celebrated more than just one day out of the year. And so, uh, but this, on this Sunday, we want you to know that we appreciate you and thank the Lord for you. If you have your Bible this morning, would you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. And this morning, I want us to look at one of my favorite moms in Scripture. Her name was Hannah. She was the mother of Samuel. And her story is recorded here in the first couple of chapters of 1 Samuel. Everything that we know about her is right here. And this morning, I want to focus on the part of her story that is recorded in chapter 1. We're going to look at all of chapter 1 this morning. And so if you found your place there in God's Word, say, I'm there. Good. 1 Samuel. It's right before 2 Samuel, if that helps, all right? 1 Samuel chapter 1. Would you stand this morning in honor of our Lord and the reading of His Word to us? 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other was Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh, also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priest of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, that would be Peninnah, also provoked her se severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. And then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? And so Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she, Hannah, was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put, a, put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured my soul out before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. And then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And so the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. And then they arose early the, the next morning, worshipped before the Lord, and returned and came to the house, to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow, but Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, and then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. And so Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best for you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. And then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. And now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bulls, one ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And then they slaughtered a bull, brought the child to Eli, 
And she said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord, and as long as he lives, he shall be lent, granted, given to the Lord. And so they worshiped the Lord there. Father, I thank you for the story of this incredible woman. I pray, God, that you teach us from it this morning things that we need to understand, things that we can learn, and things that would help us all to be better followers of Christ and better parents to our children, and all for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. When we meet this woman, Hannah, in Scripture, she has this desire in her heart to be a mom. In fact, it is a desire that is great within her. There's nothing that she wants more than to know what it's like to nurture a child, to care for a child, to love a child, to raise a child. But up until this point, it hasn't happened for her. The Bible tells us that to this point in her life, she was barren. The Lord had closed her womb. She was unable to get pregnant, unable to conceive a child. And this was, this was hard for her. She struggled with this. It caused her a great deal of sorrow. But then on top of that sorrow was the fact that her husband, Elkanah, because Hannah could not give him a child and he wanted an heir, someone that uh, would carry on the family name and continue the family lineage, he went and took for himself another wife named Peninnah. And she was able to have children. She had many children. And she reminded Hannah of this continually. The Bible says that she was always insulting Hannah, mocking Hannah, ridiculing Hannah, trying to make life as hard and difficult for Hannah as possible. And I believe the reason for that is because Elkanah loved Hannah. I believe she was his true love. And, and I believe that Peninnah could feel that. I believe that she knew that the heart of her husband was with Hannah. And so even though she could have children and she could give her husband that, she did not have the relationship with Elkanah that Hannah had with him. And she was jealous, envious of that. And so she was determined that I'm going to make life as hard and miserable for this woman as I possibly can. And she did that. She was successful. Hannah, when we meet her in Scripture, is a woman who is broken. She's discouraged. She's disappointed. She's in distress. Not only can she not have children, but now there's this situation within her home where this woman is constantly taunting her and ridiculing her. And so what does she do? She turns to the Lord. She went with her husband up to Shiloh, which uh, was the place where the tabernacle of meeting was located. It was the place where Jews would make their pilgrimage at that time to go and celebrate the three major feasts within Judaism. And so she would go with uh, Elkanah, her husband, to Shiloh to worship the Lord. And on this particular occasion, while she was there, after they had finished eating, she got up and she went off by herself to the tabernacle of meeting. And there she fell out before the Lord and she began to pray. She began to beg God for a child. And she made a promise in the midst of that prayer that if the Lord would give her a child, she would in turn give that child back to the Lord that the child would belong to God and, that, and God could do with that child's life whatever he wanted and she would not stand in the way at all. And after she had finished praying, the next morning her and her husband got up, they worshiped the Lord there in Shiloh and then they returned home. And the Bible says not long after they went home, the Lord answered her prayer. She and Elkanah conceived a child. And she would bring forth that child into the world, and she would call his name Samuel. Samuel. Samuel, who would become the greatest leader in the nation of Israel since Moses. Samuel, a young man born in the midst of dark days in the nation of Israel, spiritually, 
would rise up and be the spiritual giant that the people of God would need at such a time as this. Samuel was the son of Hannah. And there is no doubt that Hannah had a tremendous influence on the life of this child to help him become the man he would ultimately be. There is a need in the world today of more Samuels. But if we're going to have more Samuels in the world, we need more Hannahs as well. We need more moms and dads who understand the task of godly parenting and embrace it. And I believe that there are some things that we learn from this woman, Hannah, here in chapter 1 that tells her story in 1 Samuel. First thing that we learn from Hannah is this is that godly parenting views parenting itself as a privilege. Now, I'm not going to camp here for a long time, but I do want to mention this. The fact that Hannah understood that having a child and being responsible for, for raising a child was a gift from God. It was His reward to her. It was His grace poured out on her life. The Bible says that children are indeed a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is His reward. Every child born into this world, regardless of situation or circumstances, is indeed a blessing and a gift from God. And it's wonderful when parents, moms and dads, understand that. Sometimes we parents joke about the struggles of parenting, We'll make light of it, and sometimes perhaps we laugh about it to keep from crying because parenting's hard. It's tough. There's a lot of struggles that go along with parenting, especially as our kids are growing up and getting older. But don't misunderstand that parenting, no matter what, is still a blessing and a gift from God. Next to the hope and the joy that I have found in Jesus Christ, God's greatest blessings given to me are my wife and the three boys who call me dad. Hannah felt the same way. She looked at Samuel as God's gift to her. Now it raises the question this morning, and I don't want to just pass over it because I think it needs to be addressed even though I don't want to stay on this matter very long. But what about those families out there, those moms out there, those moms-to-be out there who find themselves in Hannah's position? What about them? Is the fact that you have not been able to have a child up until this point mean that God is mad at you? No. Does it mean that you've done something wrong? Absolutely not. The ways of the Lord are difficult and hard to understand sometimes. But what we do know is this, is that God is in control and God has a purpose in all things. And if you're one of those families or couples out there this morning that want to have a child, you're a, a young woman, uh, a young wife praying for a child or, or, or hoping for a child, and you're wondering, what can I do because it's not happening for me yet, I would encourage you to do the same thing that Hannah did, and that is to turn to the Lord and pray. Pray. Put the matter in God's hands because he's the one that's ultimately in control of all things anyway. And ask God that if it be his will that he would open your womb and that he would grant you a child in his own time, when the time is right, that God would give you that blessing in your life. But I want you to be open to the possibility that perhaps God may answer that prayer that you have and that desire that you have in your heart to be a mom in a way that is much different than what you have anticipated all of your life. Maybe it is that God wants to make you a parent and a mom and a dad through adoption, and through fostering. Did you know that's no less parenting? In fact, there is something beautiful and biblical about the whole concept of adoption. Adoption is rooted in the grace of God and in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where would we all be this morning had God not received us and adopted us into his own family through Jesus Christ? 
We'd be in this world without anyone on a path toward destruction. But thank God He rescued us from that fate by bringing us in and making, his, making us His very own. There's so many babies out there today and young children out there today with no one in this world but who have the desire and the need to be loved and nurtured and cared for and brought up to know the Lord and to love the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength and to serve Him all the days of their life. And it may be that God wants to use you to rescue one of those children and give them a family and show them love that they otherwise may have never known. I don't know what God's doing in your life. But I'm telling you that in Him you'll find the answer. If there's the desire to be a parent, pray that God would grant you the opportunity and that privilege of being a mom or a dad and leave it open to Him how He wants to make that happen. And understand it will all be for the glory of God. But parenting is a privilege amen second thing i want you to see is this is not only is parenting a privilege but godly parenting requires spiritual preparation before hannah ever became a mom she was preparing herself to be a mom and how did she do that first of all she did that by having a relationship with god herself one of the first things that stands out about this woman is the fact that she knew the lord and she didn't know the Lord on some surface level. Hannah had a very personal and intimate relationship with God. How do we know that? There's only two chapters that really speak to her life. But in those two chapters that talk about Hannah and tell her story, Hannah in those chapters prays a prayer, has a conversation with the priest, and then in chapter 2 prays another prayer to the Lord. And through those two prayers and that one conversation that she has with the priest, what we see and understand is that here is a woman who knew God. Because in those conversations and in those prayers that she prayed, she uses repeatedly the proper name or the personal name for God, which is the name Yahweh. You will see it identified in your English translation by being in all caps when it refers to the Lord. It's in all caps. It tells you that this is God's proper name. This is God's personal name that's being used here. The name Yahweh. Hannah uses that name over and over and over and over again. As she speaks of the Lord and as she speaks to the Lord. Here's a woman who knew the Lord. And understand that her relationship with God was important to her. She had leaned on God all of her life. Life was not always easy for Hannah. When we meet her, she's a woman in deep distress. She's got a lot going on in her life. There's some disappointment in her life. There's some situations at home that aren't very pleasant right now. But she knows where to turn to. She knows who to turn to. She turns to the Lord. She pours her heart out to God because she knows that God is her help, her hope, her strength. He's the one in whom she finds her joy. And her peace. Hannah knew the Lord. Now, why is that important? Because life is bigger than all of us, and so is parenting. Amen? And you can't do either one of those things very well if you don't know the Lord. You can't live as you should, and you can't parent as you should if you don't have a relationship with God that is real and that is personal and that is growing in your life. You just can't. The second reason why this is important is because the most important responsibility and task that a mom and dad have in this world is to raise their children to know the Lord. That, that's, the, that's the whole purpose of parenting. That's the goal of parenting, is not just to love and nurture and care for a child, but to love and nurture and care for a child and to raise that child to know the Lord, to bring that child into a relationship with the Lord, and to see the child serve the Lord all the days of his or her life. The job of mom and dad is to give their kids the gospel. 
to introduce them to Jesus Christ, help them to understand their need for a Savior, help them to understand that that Savior is Jesus Christ, help them to understand what Jesus Christ did for them in order to save them, and then help them come to that place in their life where they not only understand these things, but they embrace these things and receive these things and trust Jesus Christ to be their Lord and then begin to serve Him. Listen. It is almost impossible to give to your children something that you don't possess yourself. How do you pass on a faith that you don't already have? Hannah was already there. She knew the Lord, and she knew when God gave her a child that the most important thing in that child's life is that he would know the Lord as well and that he would serve the Lord. And so she was preparing herself as a mom before she ever became a mom by first giving herself to Jesus Christ. The the greatest thing that any young lady who ever desires to be a mom could ever do for their children to be in their life is to right now give your life to Jesus Christ and begin to grow in Him. The second thing that she did to prepare herself to be a mom is this, is she, she got married to a man who also knew the Lord. She was married to a man named Elkanah. Elkanah had a relationship with God as well. He wasn't a perfect man. That's clear by this story. He made some decisions that were rather foolish, put his family in a very difficult spot, but he still knew the Lord, and he loved the Lord. When it came time to to go up to Shiloh, he was faithful to go, to make that pilgrimage to the tabernacle of meeting, to offer the sacrifices, to participate in the worship of God. It was important to him. Not only did he do it by himself, but he also brought his family along. He and Hannah shared this together. They had this relationship with God that was meaningful, that was important to both of them. The worship of God is something that they did together. It was not something that that was a, a separate part of their life. It was something that was at the very center of their life, and that is crucial. Because when you think about God's design and God's plan for parenting, the way it's meant to be, it was always meant to be that children would be born into a home where there is a mom and there is a dad who are present. And that that mom and that dad would know the Lord and that they together would raise that child in the Lord doing everything they can to point that child to God and to follow God all the days of his or her life. That's God's design. Now, I realize that we live in a broken world that's messed up, and some things don't always go according to plan. I know that there are people out there this morning who find themselves in a situation that is less than ideal, that goes completely against what God's design is for the family. Some people are out there who are struggling doing this parenting thing on their own, by themselves, as a single parent, for a number of different reasons, perhaps. And I want you to understand that I'm not beating up on you, and I am not putting you down in any way whatsoever, because what we preach here is the gospel of grace, that we are all broken, we've all messed up, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Though it hasn't been our desire to do that, we have inevitably done that, all of us, And thank God for His grace that when we have messed it up royally, He is able to pick up the broken pieces of our life, put us back together again, and make something beautiful out of the mess that we created in our life, all because of His power and His grace. And I'm telling you that even though it is difficult to be a single parent, it's difficult to be a parent, period. There's still hope for you. If you're in Christ and Christ is in you, But it doesn't change the fact that God's ideal and God's design has always been for children to be born into a family. And as much as we preach the grace of God and how God helps us in our brokenness, we still have to hold up God's design because that design is what's best for you and it's also what's best for the children that we bring into this world. Amen? Hannah was preparing herself to be a parent before she ever became a parent. Here's the third thing I want you to see, and that's this. Godly parenting also means 
that parenting must be a priority. Parenting must be a priority. What did Hannah do after Samuel was born? She devoted herself to being a mom. Do you see that? She was devoted to being a mom. I mean, there are, good, there are things, good things, that she put aside in order to be with Samuel, to be at home with him. She no longer made the pilgrimage to Shiloh as she had done before when she was not a mom. She would go with Elkanah up to Shiloh. She would make that trip with him. But after Samuel was born, Elkanah is going up to Shiloh. Hannah says, not this time. I'm going to stay here. It's important for me. I know that that's important. But it's important for me to remain here with Samuel right now. There's going to be a time that I'm going to make that trip again. And when I make that trip, Samuel's going too, and that's going to be a, a defining moment in our life as a family and in his life as a child. But for right now, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to be with him. And here's what she knew. She'd made a promise to God, and in a few short years, she was going to have to hand this child over to God so that God could do with his life whatever he wanted. And so all she had was a small amount of time over here that's going to go by really fast. And so what she does is she takes the time that she has and she pours into this child what she can. And understand that when she's at home with Samuel, she's not just changing diapers. She's not just cooking meals. She's not just doing grocery shopping. She's doing some disciple making right here with this little boy. Because even though he's young, there are things that he can understand. Don't you think that she wasn't telling him stories about God, what God had done for his people, what God had done in her own life. Don't think that she wasn't trying to introduce him to the Lord, even though he was young, couldn't fully grasp it all, couldn't fully understand it all, but he was hearing it because his mom was pouring it into his life, preparing him for what was to come. Because she knew that's her job. That's what God called her to do. As a parent, I will never forget when Angela and I were expecting our first. I was a pastor not far from here in a different county, rural West Tennessee, very small church, very small salary. Angela is working as well because we're just a young couple getting started, but now we're expecting a child. A child for whom we had prayed. And now we're thinking about what are we going to do with this child when he gets here. We go and we sit down with a lady in town, there in Trenton, who, who would do babysitting out of her home. She had some remarkable references. Did a great job caring for kids. But like any prospective parents, we want to sit down, have a face-to-face, -face, let's talk this thing through, we need to ask you some questions. And so we're having one of those face-to-face -face meetings inside our home, looking at the place where our son would be staying if he came there to daycare. And in the course of that conversation, she said something that I've never forgotten. She looked at us and she said, with a loving heart, you, you know, and I want you to know, that I'm going to take care of your little boy. And I'm going to treat him as if he is my very own because, you ready for it? Because, truth is, he's going to be here with me almost as much in the day as he's going to be there with you. It's like a 500-pound rock just fell out of the sky. And landed on me and I started thinking about that she's right she's gonna have him as much in the day as we are and not only is she gonna have him just as much during the day as we are she's gonna have him during the best hours of his day because by the time we get off work and we pick him up and we get back home, we're, we're, we're fixing supper. We've got to get baths. Before you know it's bedtime. 
And so we've got just a small window there with him where he's awake and where we can interact and spend time with him. And the rest of that time, he's going to be with her. I went back home. I started praying. I read 1 Samuel chapter 1. Not intentionally. I didn't just run there to 1 Samuel chapter 1 saying, Lord, I need a word to back up what I'm feeling in my heart. I just opened my Bible. I found myself at 1 Samuel chapter 1. I began to read about Hannah and about what she did in the early days of Samuel's life. I went back to my wife and said, I, I, I'm telling you, I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know how we're going to do this, but I think you need to stay at home. I think God's calling you to stay at home. And I don't know how we're going to do it. I have no idea how we're going to make it. But I know that that little boy is important. And I know that we've got a small window of time, and then he, it's going to be lost. And then he's going to be in the hands of someone else. And if we don't do what we can while we can, we'll never get those years back. She quit her job. She stayed at home. And God provided. I don't know how, but he did. Now, I want to be clear about something. I don't tell you that story to put a guilt trip on anybody. And I'm not telling you that you got to do it exactly the way that Mike and Angela did it when we tried to raise our kids. But what I am telling you is this, is parenting is a priority. It's not a part-time job. It's a full-time job. And if you're going to parent your kids in a godly manner, then you're going to have to pour everything you have into your children. When Moses was talking to the people of Israel before they went into the land of promise, he was giving them instruction from the Lord. Here's what he said to them. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He said, when you, when you go into that land and you're raising your children, you need to teach your children diligently these things that the Lord has given to us. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Moses is telling them that if you're going to raise these children right, it's going to require commitment and investment on your part. You've got to give your children and parenting the best effort that you can, not the leftovers that you have after you've given to everything else. And why is that? Because the days in which we live are evil. They just are. Listen, she's trying to raise Samuel to be different, to be a champion for God, in the days of the judges. Samson has died. He's gone. And now Israel is once again in that rut where they have just drifted away from the Lord. The Bible describes these days as days in which every man did what was right in his own eyes. There's no rules. What's right, what's wrong, you make that up for yourself. You decide. Go with your gut. Do what you want to do. Live how you want to live. Does that sound familiar to anybody? And she's supposed to raise up a godly young man in the midst of all of that? How's she going to do that if she's a part-time mom? How's she going to do that if she's half committed to the task? She's got to pour herself into that if she's going to raise him the way that she should and that he needs her to raise him. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying that if you're in one of those situations where mom and dad both have to work, okay. If you prayed about that, that's what you and your family need to do, okay. But understand this. You have got to find a way and you have got to have a plan as a mom and dad how you are going to redeem the time in your child's life and how you are going to find ways to pour into that child and, and, and make the most of those early years of their life. Because if you, if you lose, listen to me, if you lose the early years of their life, you've lost the child. Amen or oh me? It's true. 
Do you know how less likely it is that a child is going to become a follower of Jesus Christ when they become a teenager? You know how even less likely that would be when they become a college student? You know how even less likely it is that a young person is going to be a follower of Jesus Christ after they have graduated from college and gotten out into the, gotten out into the world? Why is that? It's not because they've grown up and they've gotten bigger than God. It's because their heart has gotten hardened by this world and by their own sin. So that they've reached this point in their life where they feel they have no need for God when the truth is the greatest need they have in their life is for God. They're just blinded to it and they can't see it. And that's why those early years are so important in a child's life. Mom and Dad, I know it's hard. In this world, it's hard. Nobody's beating you up in this morning. Nobody's trying to tell you from this pulpit what you're supposed to do in in terms of what's best for your family. But I am telling you, you need to take it to the Lord. You need to pray over your children. You need to pray as a couple as to how we're going to raise this child and how we're going to give it our very best and how we're going to redeem the time. If we have to work outside the home, both of us, how are we going to redeem that time so that parenting is a priority for us and raising this child to the glory of God is a priority for us? Because listen, if you spend all of your time during the week away from your child and all of your weekends giving your child to someone else for other things and you're never pouring into your child, then before you know it, the years are gone and you've lost your child. Parenting's a priority. Let me give you one last thing. When you look at Hannah, you see that godly parenting requires releasing your children to follow God's plan. When Samuel was old enough to be weaned, Hannah took him to Shiloh and gave him over to the Lord just as she had promised. She left him at the tabernacle of meeting there in Shiloh, trusting him into the care of Eli the priest. You know how old Samuel was when this happened? He was probably about three or four years old. That was the the age, that was the time when mothers would wean their sons, their children. Three or four years old. She takes him to church and drops him off. Listen, don't even think about doing that tomorrow. Amen? Don't even think about doing that tomorrow. But look at what she's doing. She's she's three or four years old. And she's releasing him. She's him. She's letting him go. She's putting his life in God's hands. I know parents who are having a hard time doing that with kids that are 23 and 33 years old. He's three years old and she's releasing him. She's letting him go because it's what she promised she'd do. She promised if God gave her a child, she would give him back to the Lord and he would belong to the Lord and the Lord could do with his life whatever he wanted. You see, even though that was specifically a part of Hannah's prayer, it should ultimately be the goal of every godly parent is to understand that the child that God has given us, the children God has given us, they are gifts from God. We have them for a short time. Our job while we have them is to pour into them and to try to pass our faith along to them, to, to try to raise them, to know the Lord, to love the Lord, to serve the Lord. But ultimately, there comes this point where we have to release them so that they can follow the Lord and follow His plan for their life, whatever that looks like and wherever that takes them. We have to trust them into God's care and God's... Because, listen, listen, the bottom line is they're not yours to begin with. They never were. They were always God's. God just gave you the stewardship of being a parent to raise the child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and then to release the child to follow God's will and to do what the Lord would have that child to do all the days of his or her life. I heard Pastor Alistair Begg talk about this in a message that he preached to his congregation on parenting. And he said this, he said, if you're having difficulty with this whole thing of releasing your child, here's something that I suggest to you. Take out a white sheet of paper and write your child's name on that sheet of paper and then lay that sheet of paper out before the Lord and then say this, Lord, 
Though I am selfishly tempted to write in and fill this sheet with all of my dreams, aspirations, and plans for my child, and though in my flesh I want so much to control my child's life and future as if he or she belongs to me, I realize that this is not true. The child is not mine. He or she belongs to you. Only you know what's best for my child, and I know that you have a plan for this child's life, and therefore I put my child's life before you, and I ask that you write your plans and your desires for his or her life out on this paper. You choose the person that they are to marry. You choose the vocation they are to pursue. You choose where they are to live and how you want to glorify yourself through their life. And I pray, listen to this, and I pray that by your grace, my child will not only clearly understand what you have planned for for him or for her, but but that he or she would sign their name to it and follow it all the days of their life. That's godly parenting right there. Amen? Lord, here it is. Here's my child's life. You write in the details. You write out the plan because you have the plan for my child. You know what's best for my child. And I pray that by your grace, as my child begins to understand what that plan is, what it looks like, that he or she will sign their name to it and do it all the days of their life. That is godly parenting. So this morning... Maybe there's a mom or dad here, a young person, who needs to give their life to Christ today because the greatest thing that you could give to your child, whether your child is already here or whether you're thinking or dreaming of the day when you may become a mom or dad, the greatest thing that you can do for your child, your children, is to first give yourself to the Lord. Please understand that. To be the parent your child needs you to be. You can love that child, you can care for that child, you can do a lot of good things for that child, but you can't be the parent that God has called you to be in that child's life without a relationship with God yourself. And so you need that. And this morning, if you've never trusted Christ, I encourage you and plead with you to do that today. Maybe there's a mom or dad here that need to ask God's help in letting go because you just keep trying to hold on. And you try to keep controlling your child's life. And you know, one of the most difficult things I found as a parent, I thought some of those early days in their life were difficult, some of the challenges. But listen, the most difficult thing that I've come to as a parent is having to let go. Of having to realize that I'm not in charge. I never was really in charge. I thought I was in charge, but I never was really in charge. And I have to just release this child and trust that, that what we've poured into his life, it will not come back empty. That God is going to take what this child knows to be true and weave it into the fabric of his life and cause him to seek after him and follow him all the days he would live upon this earth. And whatever that looks like for this child, I just trust it into God's hand. And maybe you need to come to the altar today and just lay that blank sheet of paper in front of God and say, God, I'm I'm so frustrated and tired of trying to control this situation by myself. I just put it in your hands and God, I trust you. Maybe there's a single parent this morning who just needs to pray for extra mercy and extra grace as you try to parent your child alone. And I want you to know that you're not alone. The Lord is with you and you're a part of a bigger family. And understand we're all in this thing together. So I don't want you to feel like you've been put down or beat up this morning. I want you to understand we've held up God's design. Sometimes sometimes, sometimes things don't go as we plan, but thank God he's a God of mercy and grace. And a God who's able to pick up the broken pieces and overcome our weaknesses to do great things. He's proven it in his word. He's proven it over the course of history. And he can prove it in your life. But I would encourage you to come and just lay it out before the Lord. And maybe there's a parent who just needs to remember why God gave you children to begin with. And you need to get back to the task of disciple making. Maybe you've been so busy doing all these other things for your kids. Because what I hear parents say I've always heard parents say this. I know I've probably said this myself. You know what I want for my kids? I want, I want the best for my children. I, want the be- I just want to give them the best. I know you mean that. I know you do. Sometimes you lose sight of what the best really is. The best is not raising them up to do all these other things with their life. The best is to raise them up to know the Lord and to follow Him. All that other stuff won't mean anything if your child doesn't know Jesus in these days, if he's not following the Lord. 
Amen. Maybe you need to come and recommit yourself to the task of parenting. Holy Spirit of God, I pray you move this morning. Pastors are here at the front, and if people need to come and talk about their relationship with you, pray about trusting Christ, I just need somebody to pray with them. Lord, we're here this morning, but this altar is open. Your spirit, I trust, is moving. And God, whatever you would lead parents to do, or young men, young ladies in this room, grandparents, God, however you've spoken, and however you're leading, however we need to respond, God, I pray that we would do so to the glory of Christ as we seek to raise a generation again who would love you and know you in the midst of these dark days and would become spiritual giants for Jesus Christ in this world to make a difference to the glory of God. God, we know you can do it, but it starts in the home with mom and dad. And so let us be the first on our knees, the first crying out this morning for help and for mercy and grace and strength and forgiveness. And maybe again commit ourselves to this task, this holy, and wholesome task of raising children to the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together this morning as we sing. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. And He is a mighty King. Master. Lord's good, amen? We're so glad that you're here this morning. I hope that you'll stay for life groups. They will begin in just a few moments. You've never been to one of our life groups, stop by our information centers. We have people there. would love to show you uh, the groups that are meeting this morning. We'll do anything we can to help direct you to a group that, uh, that would be for you, where you are at, at uh, this place in life. And it's just believers gathered around the Word of God, growing together in their relationship to Him, as well as growing closer together in their relationship with Christ. And so hope that you'll stay and be a part of that special time. It'll start here in just a few minutes. No evening activities tonight. Just want to make you aware of that. And uh, I hope you have a great Mother's Day, moms. May you be celebrated in a big way and thank the Lord for you. Um, you deserve a double honor, do double portion today for all the blessings that you brought into our lives. So thank the Lord for you. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for the morning. Uh, thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of the rain, uh, Lord, your spirit is here with us, showers of blessings on the inside as we open your word, as you pour into us. And God, I pray today that you will have encouraged us and helped us and strengthened us as moms and dads to be all that we can be for the glory of Christ and for the good of our children. Lord, it's such a sacred task that you've given us. It's overwhelming, bigger than any of us. But God, we thank you that we're not left alone. And thank you, Lord, for the strength and the help that you give. And thank you, Lord, that even today we see you raising up godly young men and women to the glory of Christ, who I believe are going to be difference makers in this world. May it continue to the glory of Christ until Jesus comes. 
Bless as we go into our small groups. I pray, God, that you'll fill every life group with your presence and your spirit this morning. Use this time to open your word to us and speak into our lives and help us to grow closer to Christ and closer to each other. We pray it today in Jesus' name. Amen.